Madeline Astor was the widow of the wealthiest man on the Titanic who went down with the ship on her maiden voyage, John Jacob Astor. She was merely a teenager, 18, and just one year older than his son when she started dating the 40-something John Jacob, which caused his first wife of almost 20 years to divorce him. I covered that scandal in my previous video that I will link in the description box. Also, in that video, I asked you all if you wanted me to tell you the story of Madeline's third marriage, which was a cause of great embarrassment to her. So many of you said, yes, Ty, I want to know what happened. I'm glad that you all wanted to know because I was going to tell you anyway. The story is just that fascinating to me. Madeline ended her romance in first class with her first husband, millionaire John Jacob Astor, and she started her romance on another ocean liner, inviting a guy from second class to dine with her. He would become her third husband, Italian boxer Enzo Firmante. She was on the prowl for an Italian stallion, and he wanted some of that ass. Stir fortune. Was he her karma, plus some extra? Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear, who make Ty's Hot Miss History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream, and hit that like button to support this video. Thank you. Now, on to why you are here. When the Titanic hit the iceberg on April 14, 1912, at 11.40 p.m. ship's time, she sank less than three hours later, in the early morning hours of April 15th and all of the ladies in first class, except for five, survived. Madeline Astor was one of those ladies who survived, thanks in part to her husband, who saw to it that she got into a lifeboat. John Jacob Astor took care of Madeline in the physical sense on his last day on Earth, and he had taken care of her and their unborn child in the financial sense, months before they ever left the country for their extended vacation. For his unborn son, he had left a $3 million trust. For his wife, Madeline, he left an outright sum of $100,000, which, adjusted for inflation, is worth a little more than $3 million today in 2023. Now, that $100,000 she got no matter what, but John threw in a couple of extras for her on the condition that she never remarried. The use of his Fifth Avenue mansion and the income from a $5 million trust. Sounds like a nice deal. So of course she collected her inheritance and lived happily ever after, right? Of course not. If she had, I certainly wouldn't be telling that boring story here. We need the hot mess, and boy oh boy did she ever land in one. Madeline would marry two more times after the death of John Jacob Astor. The first time was to wealthy banker William Carl Dick. He had actually been a childhood friend to Madeline. He didn't have Astor money, but he was the vice president of a trust company and part owner of the Brooklyn Times newspaper. So, losing her stipend from the Astor $5 million trust didn't exactly cause her any financial stress. They had two boys together and eventually divorced, the standard stuff of which divorces are made, no real hot mess there. But that second time that she married after John Jacob Astor died, Wow. If anyone held a grudge against her and considered her to be a young little floozy of a gold-digging homewrecker for being Astor's mistress while he was married to his first wife, Ava, well, they probably got a little bit of joy from seeing how the tables turned on Madeline with this third husband. When John Jacob Astor met Madeline in 1909, he was deeply infatuated by a young girl who wanted to be with him. He had lust in his eyes, and she likely had dollar signs in her eyes. Fast forward to 1932, aboard the Volcania ocean liner, and now Madeline, at the age of 39, and according to numerous sources, bathing quickly in the looks department, sat across a dinner table from Enzo Fiermante, with lust in her eyes. He was only 24. He was Italian, and there had long been sexual stereotypes about Italian men that made them out to be good lovers. 
and he was a prize fighter, a boxer. So, because of his profession, he was known to have a great physique and thought to be well-conditioned. So you can imagine all of the thoughts that her dirty little mind was conjuring up. By the way, she was not quite divorced from William Carl Dick yet. Just like Astor wasn't divorced when he started fooling around with Madeline, so many parallels. As for Enzo Firmante, his intentions were not pure with her either. But while she wanted sex from him, he wanted money from her. Yes, he was a prize fighter, but he wasn't a very good one. And he wasn't very different from a lot of 24-year-old men at any point in history. He wanted expensive clothes and watches and fast cars and women. So they sat across from each other at the dinner table, staring at each other and fantasizing. Madeline staring at his handsome face and how well his frame filled out his suit and wondering what was going on underneath it. Enzo, staring at her diamond rings and pearl necklace, wondering how much a pawn shop would pay him for the jewelry. It was Madeline's doctor who, yes, traveled with her because after Titanic, traveling made her a ball of nerves, as you can imagine. Anyway, it was her doctor who thought that it would be a keen idea to invite Enzo from second class to join Madeline for dinner in first class, and it would be her doctor who convinced Enzo to see Madeline for the second time. See, after Enzo had dinner with her that first night, he vowed to himself to never see her again because he had a wife back home in Italy, a wife and a son, but that guilt didn't last long. Like literally the next day, Enzo went up to the first-class deck to see Madeline again. Her doctor had convinced Enzo that some of Madeline's rich friends might be of benefit to him and his boxing career. And let's just say the doctor didn't have to tell Enzo twice. He spent the whole day with Madeline, playing deck tennis and backgammon and eating and drinking. They were on a date that lasted all day. It was as if Tosca and Gianni didn't exist. You don't know who they are? Yeah, neither did Enzo at the time. Tosca was his wife and Gianni was his baby boy. That vow that he had made to himself when he went to sleep that night after he met Madeline was broken as soon as he woke up the very next morning. And after spending that glorious day of fun with Madeline, he told her that she was beautiful. When she smiled. And he did make that distinction. He said that when she smiled, she looked pretty and young, but that normally she looked old and frumpy. He kept the old and frumpy part to himself that night. That would come out later when he started flapping his gums to the press. But that night, she was beautiful. She told him that she thought that he was trying to flatter her because she knew that she didn't look as attractive as she used to when she was younger. Well, he told her he meant it, and he kissed her on their second night together. It was after dinner, and they were out on the deck, under the moonlight. Enzo said that they were in, quote, a misty romantic heaven, end quote. Then he left the fantasy world of first class with his rich girlfriend and her fancy wealthy friends and retired to his second class reality, and the guilt set in once again. He started thinking about his wife and son back home in Italy. Before the cruise was over, he confessed to Madeline that he had a wife and that he needed to stop seeing Madeline. Well, Madeline, still married herself, said, damn that, okay? She said that she was not giving up that hard penne. She was very persistent about continuing her relationship with Enzo. So much so, that when their ship docked in Naples, before he disembarked to go off to see his wife and kid, she told him to join her at the Lido in Venice. Well, from Naples, Enzo went home to reunite with his wife and son, where he did not tell his wife about his affair with the American woman on the Volcania cruise ship. He barely had enough time to unpack his luggage when he received a telegram from Madeline that read, quote, Darling, come and see me. If not, I am going to Rome. End quote. 
In response, Signore Fioravante hopped his behind on a train to Venice and upon arriving there, booked a room at the Excelsior on the Lido. And shortly thereafter, his American woman met him there and they got down to business. And I don't mean the kind of business that requires spreadsheets, but spread lengths instead. You know what I mean? Now, I won't go into great detail about that night that they shared in Venice because I need to keep my YouTube channel, but Enzo went into great detail about it, sharing with one publication how great it was, but still harping on her age. Clearly, the age difference was a big deal for him, and I get it. He was only 24 and she was 39. But here's what he said, in part, quote, She was different. Everything about her was subtly changed from the woman I had met on the ship. It was as if the years had slipped away from her. I saw her as a young and beautiful girl. End quote. Sheesh. He saw her as young, but he definitely knew that she wasn't. That would be a recurring theme in their relationship. Well, long story short, Madeline and Enzo abandoned their respective spouses and married each other on November 27, 1933. And just like her first marriage, this third one was also a scandal in high society and talked about in the newspapers. For her first marriage, her husband, J.J. Astor, was painted as the old creep who wanted a young plaything. For her third marriage, she was now in the role of the creep, and her husband, Enzo, was the young plaything. Here's what was written in a 1933 Christmas Day edition of the Garrett Clipper. Ladies and Fighters Society lifts an eyebrow as Mrs. Madeline Force Dick is married to Enzo Firmante, an Italian prize fighter. Mrs. Dick happens to be the widow of Jacob Astor, who stepped aside as the Lusitania was sinking to permit his then youthful bride to take her place with the other women and children in a lifeboat. Okay, so let me stop there. Force was her maiden name and Dick was her second husband's name. And we all know that J.J. Astor died in the sinking of the Titanic, not the Lusitania. That is a crazy mistake for a newspaper to print because of the impact that Titanic had on the world at that time. The Lusitania was another grand, luxurious ocean liner that was owned by a different company from the owners of the Titanic. The Titanic was owned by the White Star Line, and the Lusitania was owned by Cunard. Cunard also owned the Carpathia, the ship that came to rescue Titanic's passengers. These companies were in constant competition to create the best vessels to transport the wealthy back and forth from Europe to the United States. The Lusitania, which was erroneously placed in this article, sank on May 7, 1915, three years after Titanic, after being torpedoed by German submarine U-20. Ironically, the Lusitania has a loose tie to the 1997 James Cameron Titanic movie. At the beginning of the film, when Rose sees the Titanic, she tells her fiancé that it doesn't look much more impressive than the Mauritania. The Mauritania was a sister ship to the Lusitania, and when she launched in 1906, she was the biggest ship on the sea, stretching out at 790 feet, which was beat out by Titanic's 883 feet. So it would have made perfect sense for people in those times to make those comparisons. I don't see what all the fuss is about. It doesn't look any bigger than the Mauritania. You could be blasé about some things, Rose, but not about Titanic. It's over 100 feet longer than Mauritania, and far more luxurious. But back to the article. We also get a little more shape thrown at Madeline's age. Astor's then youthful bride. Okay, we get it. She's not young. It goes on to read. Discussion of the marriage makes much of the tragic background of Fiormante's bride. To think, say the dowagers, that Madeline would do such a thing as marry a prize fighter after Astor's noble act in permitting her to be saved while he himself went to certain death. But then, 
Mrs. Madeline Astor Dick is a woman, after all. Enzo Fiermonte, even though he be a prize fighter, is a man. It is the inalienable privilege of any woman to marry any man, society's eyebrow to the contrary notwithstanding. So, this newspaper was definitely firing some shots at Enzo's low social standing, and also basically saying that Madeline wasn't worth saving from the Titanic or Lusitania. Now that her life had come to this, oh well, she was all smiles at the beginning. But by the time that this was over, this marriage, Enzo made Madeline wish that she had kept her home wrecking ways back in 1909, for she would leave this relationship abused, bruised, and confused. So, about the broken arm. From the first time that Madeline slept with Enzo on the Volcania cruise ship, she was obsessed with him and she had to have him. He was her possession, and she paid for him to travel to all of her homes and luxury rentals all over the world. She was proud to call Enzo hers. In the winter of 1933, she rented a 15-room mansion in Palm Beach, and Enzo came there too. So did her son, John Jacob, and her doctor. Now, at this time, her son was 20, and he didn't hold back his opinions. He didn't like his mother being with Enzo, and he made it clear. So did the doctor. There were so many two-on-one arguments that eventually, Enzo got fed up and left to go back to New York. But guess who left Florida to go find him? Yes, Madeline had her chauffeur pull up to Enzo's gym, where she retrieved her possession. He said that he saw the window of her car roll down, and a white glove came out of that window and signaled for him to come hither. And he did. As much as he admitted to not wanting to be with Madeline, he also admitted that often he would play right into when she would chase him down. He said that he happily left his gym and went back to her New York home with her. The happiness between the two of them never lasted for long. They always argued about whether or not they should even be together, and he was always the one who thought that they should end it. He would leave or threaten to leave. Then she would throw a few thousand dollars his way or buy him something expensive, and then he would get happy for a few days and stay. Then the cycle would start all over again. Madeline kept pressing him to get a divorce. Yes, even at this point, they were both still married. Her plan was to have Enzo get a divorce, then she could pay a sum of $10,000 to Enzo's little boy back home in Italy, Gianni. And for the low price of $10,000, she could then have Enzo all to herself. So, even though, as this story progresses, it will be very clear to see that Enzo was horrible to her, Madeline certainly had a part to play in this farce of a marriage, and she was not innocent. How selfish can a woman be? A mother at that who was totally comfortable with the idea of giving a boy money, which was chump change to her, in the place of his father. She really didn't care about Enzo's wife and child, or about Enzo being a part of his child's life. Now, clearly, at some point, Enzo didn't care either, and I don't expect for her to care more about his family than he did. But I do find it odd, to say the least. When I see women who like being in romantic relationships with men who don't take care of their children, it's even worse when they support the bad behavior. Anyway, she told Enzo to write home to his wife and ask for a divorce. His wife, Tosca, wrote back and said she would never give him a divorce. She fought for him till the end. Her part in this gets crazier. But eventually, Tosca caved. That $10,000 wasn't a lot to Madeline, but Tosca, according to several news outlets, was from, quote, peasant stock. And that $10,000 was a life-changing amount of money for someone like her. Adjusted for inflation, it had the buying power that $230,000 has today in 2023. So she agreed to take the money, but she still wanted her husband. 
A celebrity gossip reporter named Elsa Maxwell caught wind of the transaction and wrote, quote, John Jacob Astor's widow finally used part of her fortune to buy herself an Italian boxer for a husband, end quote. That reporter only wrote what everybody was thinking. She was paying to keep that young Italian man in her presence. Now, you can imagine that that was a blow to Madeline and Enzo. She looked like a desperate fool, and he was a loser who needed a woman to pay his way in life. In July of 1933, Madeline's divorce was finalized. She celebrated by taking Enzo to Lake Tahoe and throwing her wedding ring into the lake. That part of her story disgusted me because the value of that ring could have done some good for someone somewhere. But I digress. Every move that Madeline made was printed in the newspapers and her divorce was no exception. But now, the divorce news was old. All of the reporters wanted to know when she was going to marry the young Italian boxer. Madeline was used to the press following her for stories and quotes and photos. Enzo wasn't, and he didn't know how to handle it. When members of the press started swarming him and asking when he and Madeline Astor were going to get married, he tried to play it off like he didn't know her very well. Astor, I hardly know her. Well, he really could not handle the pressure, so he told Madeline once again that he was going to leave her, and he did. Again, this time, she hired private detectives to track him down so that she could go to him and bring him back. But even after she found him, he stuck to his guns. He told a reporter that he would never marry her because she's too old. He knew that Madeline would see that, and he thought that it might make her leave him alone for good. It didn't. Madeline had an attorney call Enzo to let him know that his wife, in Italy, agreed to the divorce settlement terms. So now he was free to marry Madeline. Yay! <laughs> he admitted that he challenged himself and questioned himself on what his attraction was to Madeline. And he knew and told himself that it was her money. So when he finished his business with the attorney, he went to meet Madeline in Bermuda to tell her that he was going to go to London to continue his boxing career. Again, he told her that he was going to leave her. He told her that she needed to marry a man from her own social class. And a lot of people would say that that was the reasonable and right thing for him to do and say. Well, Madeline had a fit and told him, you mean I'm too old. He told her that it wasn't about her age, but that her way of living was wrong and he didn't feel like a real man being a rich woman's possession. After he told her that, he turned to walk towards the door and leave. Then Madeline caught up with him and grabbed his hair, telling him that he could not leave her. Enzo said that he pressed down on her with both of his arms so that she would release her grip on his hair. Well, he ended up pushing her to the floor and breaking her arm. He picked her up and yelled for the doctor who was always with her. The doctor called for an ambulance. She was treated in a hospital in Bermuda for a few weeks and then eventually taken back to Manhattan to get full medical attention. She arrived back in New York on a stretcher, greeted by a mob of reporters and photographers that were able to catch some version of this image. She is trying to hide her face with her coat. Her son, William Dick Jr., is the one who was the closest to her stretcher, trying to help her cover her face and arm. She lied to everyone about why her arm was broken. The story that she told the news media was that she had slipped and fell on a highly polished floor in her vacation home. And it was right after this incident that the couple got married. While Madeline was still in a hospital bed at the doctor's hospital, on November 27th, 1933. This article from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle on the day after the wedding tells that the dozen friends and intimates who attended were sworn to secrecy about the strange affair. But we do get to see who some of the attendees were. They included Madeline's mother, Mrs. Forrest, 
who attended all three of her daughter's weddings. There was a mention that she was the most enthusiastic about the first wedding. Madeline's mother was a big-time social climber, so I can imagine that she became increasingly less enthusiastic with each of Madeline's spouses. And Madeline's second husband was still a millionaire. He just didn't have Aster money, but who did? So I can only imagine that Mrs. Force's excitement level was somewhere in the gutter when she saw that Madeline was going to go through with this marriage to Enzo. But back to the happy day. Madeline's three sons all attended as well. But let's be clear. This was the wedding that no one wanted, except for Madeline, not even Enzo. Just because her sons were there didn't mean that they approved. Even Vincent Astor, her stepson from John Jacob Astor's first marriage, did his part to keep Enzo away from Madeline. In the same wedding article, it's mentioned that Enzo couldn't get to Madeline at first while she was in Bermuda. Well, that was Vincent's doing. It is explained further in another article about the wedding from the same date in the Daily News. It explains that after Enzo's divorce was finalized, Madeline put $5,000 in the bank for him, another one of her little treats for him and a thank you gift for going through with his divorce. Then he headed to meet her in Bermuda, but Vincent Astor, who had a lot of influence on the island, decided that Enzo shouldn't be allowed entry onto the island, so he wasn't, until Vincent changed his mind and allowed it. Vincent was the one with the real connections and way more money than John Jacob Astor, the Titanic baby. You might recall that John Jacob Astor left a $3 million trust for the John Jacob who Madeline was pregnant with on the Titanic. That money was more than enough to make him rich in those times, but it was a lot less than his half-brother Vincent received from their father's will. And that was something that little John Jacob never seemed to get over. Well, that is day one of their marriage, and it only gets worse from here. Madeline and Enzo had drummed up enough headlines just from their time openly dating while both were still married to other people. More headlines followed after the wedding with reporters questioning why she left her quiet and successful husband to marry a broke boxer. Madeline's stepson, Vincent Astor, tried to use his political connections on more than one occasion to keep Enzo away from her. In addition to not permitting him on the island of Bermuda, when he met there to meet Adeline before they got married, Vincent also pulled a stunt to prevent Enzo from re-entering the United States by phoning a friend of his, President Roosevelt. Yeah, I told you in part two that Vincent was the one with the real power and money. Unlike the Titanic baby, John Jacob, who couldn't pull any power moves like his half-brother. But instead, it seems that he took the route of acting out, almost like a cry for attention when he announced his engagement to a debutante just one week after his mother married the boxer. He never made it down the aisle with her, but just six months later, he got married to another Manhattan girl who fit the bill because she was also from a prominent family. Her name was Ellen Tuck French, and she was a cousin to the Vanderbilts. His mother showed up for his wedding, but his new penniless, pugilist stepfather did not. But it seems like after this point, the atmosphere became a little more calm for the couple. For a few months, they were only being talked about in newspapers for being on vacation. Here they are almost two months exactly after the wedding on vacation in Palm Beach. Here they are a couple of weeks after that in Lake Worth, which is just about 10 miles away from Palm Beach, so likely on the same vacation. And about two weeks after that, not a photo of the couple, but of the home that Madeline was paying to rent for their extended vacation. A mansion called Nuestro Paradiso, which means our paradise in Spanish. It had a private beach in the rear. And if ever a couple needed privacy, it was that pair. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't comment on the title of this blurb. Our paradise is Fiermonte Dick Home. 
That's what we've been saying about Madeline this whole time. We all knew her motive, to have fear Monte's dick at home. And about another two weeks after that, on February 25th, the couple appears in another paper, this time on Madeline's new boat, which is simply called Fun. That is ironic. Most of their marriage was not smooth sailing and was far from anything that people would call fun. And surely enough, exactly four months later on June 25th, there are signs of trouble in paradise, or at least the paradise that they were pretending existed between the two of them. An article titled, Enzo Parts But Fails to Kiss the Misses, told its readers a few things. One, clearly from the title, he left but didn't kiss his wife goodbye. Not a big deal if he was going to the store to grab some milk, but he was going to be gone from their West Hampton Beach vacation home for at least a week. He had told a friend where he was going and said that he wasn't sure when he would come back. His reason for going? Business conferences. Now, he had five pieces of luggage and owned zero businesses, but okay. Two. He had announced the Friday before this article was published that he was retiring from boxing, which was something that Madeline desperately wanted him to do. 3. Less than a week later, he was talking about getting back into the ring to fight. When questioned about whether getting back to boxing would upset his new bride, he said, quote, I don't care if she is worth $5 million or $10 million. I'm boss in my house. End quote. Four. Neighbors had reported that they saw Enzo yelling at his butler to get rid of photographers days before this story was published. Allegedly, he said, Get that mob out of here or I'll catch hell. And yes, the neighbors were watching the newlyweds. Then, two months later, on August 21st, well, there's no story here, but they say that a picture says a thousand words. The young, and I do stress young, lady in the photo with him is an actress named Toby Wing. The caption says that he was getting acting advice from her. Maybe he was. All that I'm going to say is, in all of the photos that I have gone through of him and Madeline to research for this series, I have not seen one of him smiling at Madeline like he is smiling at this young lady. And maybe he should have hurried up and applied whatever advice the young actress gave him to get an acting gig, because his next appearance in the news was the following month, on September 30th, getting his ass knocked out in a boxing match. Then, two months after that, the next piece of bad press was for Mrs. Piermonte. She, along with Elliot Roosevelt, lost their Blue Book status. The Blue Book was merely a social register of the who's who in New York City. It let everybody know that you were a New Yorker with money and class. For Elliot, the second son of President Roosevelt, he took it pretty nonchalantly. He knew that his name was dropped from the register simply because he had moved from New York two years prior to them removing his name. But as for Madeline, she was dropped from the register because of her marriage to Enzo. And this was society's way of telling her that you are a New Yorker with money, but class, Mm, not so much. That was November of 1934, and really the last article that I see about either of them worth mentioning for that year. 1934 definitely ended on a bad note for the Union. But you know what they say, New Year, New You. And the first January story that I found about them from 1935 showed that things were looking optimistic for these two insufferable donkeys. It's the Daily News, January 31st, and Madeline is back to her old, creepy, foolish self in full swing. The article is called, Overlook SOS, We're in Love, Enzo's Latest. Here's the story that was reported. Enzo was headed back to Europe on an Italian liner called the SS Roma. He was leaving for Europe without his old wife. Not only did he leave without Madeline, but another woman saw him off. As he was getting ready to board the ship, goodbyes were exchanged between him and a woman named Mrs. Adela Rogers St. John's. Now, I'm not saying that she was having an affair with Enzo. 
but I'm not saying that she wasn't. I will simply say that she looked like this, as opposed to how his wife looked. And shortly after her dealings with Enzo, her husband wanted a divorce from her. So, while Enzo is saying his goodbyes to Adela, and she's standing on the pier, waiting until the ship leaves with her friend on it, little does he know that his crazy old wife is already on the ship. Yes, while he was saying see you later to his friend, Adela, his wife slipped right past him and got on the ship. Madeline intentionally did not register her name on the passenger list because she wanted to surprise her hubby. And apparently she did just that. The story doesn't give details on exactly how it happened, but at some point after Enzo realized that his wife was on the ship, he was excited to see her. My guess is that he knew that she would give him some more allowance money to spend on his European vacation that he clearly had no intention of her being a part of before. Nevertheless, he sent a radiogram to one of his friends expressing his happiness due to the discovery of Madeline on his ship. It read, quote, Wife's aboard, God help me. In spite of previous statements in the press, I am glad to say that Mrs. Fiermonte and I are reconciliated, end quote. The next day, February 1st, newspapers would print why Enzo had a change of heart. See, he got on the SS Roma to sneak away from Madeline. But while they were on the ship, she wrote a series of love letters and apology letters to him, having a ship steward carry them to his room eventually, like after a few days at sea. But while she was in her cabin writing love letters, Enzo was running his mouth all over the ship bragging about how he had escaped from his wife. This daily news story from February 1st, 1935, gives a little more of the backstory on this loving reunion. The article is titled, Enzo Couldn't Resist Wife's Tender Notes. Now, I just have to wonder, because those gossip columnists were so shady in the 1930s, was this an intentional play on words because both tender and notes mean legal currency or money? And by this point, everyone was well aware that Enzo was far more attracted to Madeline's money than any other thing about her. So let me know if you think that that writer was being funny with this title. The story makes it clear that for Enzo, the so-called Italian Apollo, this trip was a voyage of escape that somehow turned into a second honeymoon. He became very popular on the ship from day one, and on his first day on the voyage, he was telling all of the strangers in the ship's main saloon that he had made a quote-unquote clean getaway. It was written that he sarcastically waved goodbye to the Statue of Liberty, and then made his way to the ship's gymnasium for a medicine ball workout with the instructor on board. What he told the instructor was in the paper too. Workout grunts included. Quote, It is uh, marvelous to be free, he said as the heavy ball flew back and forth. No more uh, private detectives shadowing me. No more gossip. Only Algiers and Marseille in a visit to my first wife and our child. Ah, and I was very uh, smart in slipping out the way I did." End quote. Meanwhile, old dum-dum Madeline had locked herself in her cabin and committed her time to writing love letters that she was certain would win him back. At some point, those letters were delivered to Enzo's room by a steward who said that Enzo's face went white when he saw who wrote the letters. Then, he wrote back to her and they started writing back and forth to each other. After a whole day of writing until midnight, Enzo was adamant in telling Madeline that he did not want to be with her. They wrote some more letters the next day. Then he reluctantly agreed to meet her for dinner in her cabin. After that dinner... His own cabin was not occupied for the next two nights, nor was he seen at the main saloon with the friends he had made on his first day, who were laughing at his jokes about Madeline. 
And we know from before that he got around to saying that they were back together and that he was so happy. In case you didn't know what happened before, parts 1, 2, and 3 are linked in the description box. Now, we know that part of Enzo's plans on his getaway was to see his first wife. Well, Madeline didn't know that. And when she learned, literally just one week after it was reported that they were back in love, it was obvious to see that she didn't like that Enzo was going to see his family back home. As this headline from the February 8th Star Gazette explains, Madeline cried, lost it, and cut off his allowance. Just the day before, she was confidently telling the press that she and Enzo were going to have big fun in France. Well, what a difference a day makes, because on this day, she was reported as being semi-hysterical, just repeating over and over, I can't say anything. I don't know anything about this. I don't know what I'm going to do. She said that, but she did quickly figure out one thing to do. She cut off his money. Frankly, at this point, he should have seen that coming, and I don't feel sorry for either one of these people. Madeline was sad because she didn't have Enzo. Enzo was sad because he didn't have Madeline's money. But one person was happy. Tosca, Enzo's first wife. She said, quote, When I met him in Genoa, he was very happy to see me and our child. There were tears in his eyes. We went to a cafe and spent some hours together. Yes, I still love him dearly. I think he loves me. He may come back to me, but not immediately. End quote. My God, what was it about this man? The next few days, there were a number of headlines about Enzo and his first wife meeting each other. All of them expressed something along the lines of Enzo meets wife number one and wife number two cried about it. Even though he made it clear that he met Tosca and had love for her and his son, he also made it clear that he was staying with Moneybags Madeline. His mother weighed in and seemed to approve of his decision. She told the Daily News, quote, My son really loves the American lady a great deal. Although she is older than he, Enzo says she seems much younger than she is. End quote. Something tells me that if Madeline hadn't been rich, that his mother would not have approved of her son's love match. But she was rich. And even though wife number one wanted her husband back from wife number two, she still had a reason to be happy that Madeline had entered her life. With the money that Madeline had sent to Tosca in exchange for her husband, Tosca, the peasant, was able to buy a nice apartment for herself and quit her job at a shirt factory. And she was happy about that. The one who wasn't happy was Madeline. She didn't like the publicity that she and her husband had been getting on this trip to Italy. All of the papers were really playing up the fact that he would wander about and do as he pleased without his wife. I can understand why she didn't like that, even if it was true, and it was. The news stories were also talking about how much Enzo loved his son, Giovanni. She didn't like that either. That is one part about Madeline that I just do not like. She really had a problem with the fact that Enzo loved his son. It seems like she just wanted him to be so mesmerized by her money that he would forget that he had a whole family before he met her. Her problem with the way that she was being reported on during the Italian fiasco was that she was being called, quote, an American millionaires who is jealous. Well, if the shoe fits. But in less than two weeks' time, Madeline would be smiling again because she was going to use the one thing that she had that kept her husband crawling back to her, her money. She would give his wife another five-figure payday in exchange for Enzo in a once-and-for-all no backseas deal. And she would buy Enzo a brand new car in exchange for some affection from him for a few days. So now it's time for Moneybags Madeline to shell out some dough so that she can keep that hunk of a man who hates her guts. She snuck onto his ship when she found out that he was on his way to Italy. At this point in February of 1935, everybody was in Italy. Enzo, his first wife, and son, and Madeline. 
and it was looking like Enzo was going to have to stay longer than he planned because the Italian government was holding his passport. The reason that he was given was that Italy was not going to recognize his divorce from his first wife, Tosca. Instead, they would charge him with bigamy and lock him up in prison. Usually, a problem for Enzo meant a problem for Madeline, but she was actually okay with the idea of his being locked away because at least in prison, there wouldn't be any other women she'd have to compete with for his affection. I'm not even joking. Check out this headline from the Buffalo News. Enzo's wife fearful of U.S. girls' wiles. Therefore, Madeline planned to keep her lovely boy, as she called him, away from New York. Sounds like a great plan to me. All that Madeline wanted was to live in peace with her lovely boy, who she also called a god and a Greek statue. But the pesky young girls just wouldn't leave him alone and let him be faithful. Luckily for her, the Italian authorities had locked him up so that no women could get to him, not even his lawful wife, Tosca. Wait a minute, doesn't that make Madeline a paranoid hypocrite? I think that it does. She was lucky to have him behind bars, and he was lucky that she had a lot of money. She would end up sticking by his side and paying to get him out. Literally just one day and $17,000 later, Enzo's problems were solved. Tosca settled on 200,000 lira as a settlement to make the divorce a reality. I guess that she liked big round numbers. That's a little more than $375,000 in today's currency that Madeline shelled out to get her man back. But she wasn't done spending. Of course she had to get him a little treat for all of his trouble. So she bought him a brand new fancy sports car and the couple made plans to leave Italy and ride off into the sunset with France as their next destination. Can to be exact. While they were waiting on Enzo's passport to be returned, which took a few days, another interesting thing occurred when Madeline entertained Tosca, aka Mrs. Piermonte No. 1, for tea at her luxurious hotel. I'm sure that Enzo loved that. Unfortunately for us nosy Mastorians, Enzo's mother also attended this tea, and all of the quotes in the papers are from her. It's the same old stuff. She liked Enzo's new rich wife, she knew that Madeline was older than her son, but she seemed the same age as her son. She seemed really young. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever you say, Mom. Just keep those dollars rolling into the family, right? But we do get this interesting description of Tosca. She's called the fighter's sturdy, black-haired first wife who comes from Italian peasant stock. Ouch. Now... I have to take just a quick moment to defend Tosca. This photo of her was used almost all of the time in the newspapers. But in March of 1935, I saw this photo. Clearly, she used some of that money that Madeline paid her to get a makeover. But in all of my research, I only saw this photo of her once. But I digress. What happened on March 9th? more than makes up for this news fest printed in the papers about the two wives meeting. Well, Enzo took Madeline to France in that new car she got for him, and this sub-headline summed up what happened next rather succinctly. Enzo Fiormonte, dapper Italian prize fighter, and his second wife, Mrs. Madeline Force Astor Dick Fiormonte, made a hasty exit out a side door of their hotel today when Enzo's first wife, Tosca, roared into town on the Rome Express, volubly proclaiming she had come to reclaim him. Okay, so here's what happened. Madeline and Enzo called themselves going on honeymoon number two. So they were getting ready to step out for the evening to do the Riviera. Well, Tosca had taken a train to France to track them down, and she did just that. Why? Because she wanted her man back. You see how the papers followed and printed their every move. So, Tosca knew their hotel, so she thought. But they switched their plans and went to a different hotel, and she still tracked them down. When she arrived at the hotel, she demanded the front desk staff to allow her entry to Enzo's suite. 
they flat out denied her request, as they should have. She explained to the workers in what was described as strong language that she had come to collect her man, regardless of the money that his wife had paid her and would continue to pay her. She argued back and forth with them for a while, but they never gave her access to Enzo's room. So, she settled for a room as close to their suite as she could get. Now, this was not a quiet conversation that she was having with the hotel staff. So, Enzo and Madeline could hear everything. So, as Tosca was settling into her room so that she could wait for an Enzo appearance in the hallway in the middle of the night, he and Madeline slipped out of a side door of the building, got into his new car, thank goodness it was a race car, and they made their escape. Again, I ask, what was it about this man? Meanwhile, on the very same day as all of this commotion, Enzo's lady friend, the one who he was saying goodbyes to when he left for Europe, thinking that Madeline didn't know, yeah, Adela Rogers St. John, her. Her husband was trying to divorce her because of her affiliation with Enzo Fiermonte. One of the hardest parts for me to understand in this story is why a woman who had been married to two millionaires, one of them among the richest men in the world, would drain her bank account to be in a marriage like this one. Anyway, they were on the run. They got away from wife number one. Meanwhile, Enzo had lied to the press about ever having seen his first wife in Italy or that he had ever been charged with bigamy, even though all of this had been very well documented. Maybe someone could have found all of the drama that surrounded Enzo to be exciting, but all of this seems like way too much for a normal person to bear, and Madeline just appeared to be aging by the second. Her friends were starting to feel sorry for her and her crazy life. They were commenting on how her beauty was just gone. And according to the few society friends that were still willing to allow her to come around, Enzo was starting to demand money from her and beat her. That was their norm for the next two years. Then in July of 1937, Enzo put his hands on someone else, a man this time. He loved driving his sports cars fast. That earned him a speeding charge. Well, he never answered the charge. The charge was from 1934, three years before. He was just irresponsible. God knows that Madeline had the money to pay for the ticket, and she would have paid for it if he had told her about it. So he ended up getting sentenced to five days at Rikers Island Prison. At his sentencing, the press was there, just like they had been for every moment of his life since he had been with Madeline. He should have expected it. But when reporters were questioning him about being sentenced, he punched one of the cameramen twice, landing a left and a right far more successfully than he had been able to do in the boxing ring. I guess that he would have won more fights if his opponents had been holding big cameras and they were not expecting him to hit them. Enzo showed up hours late to this court date and the judge wasn't having it. That's why he was sentenced to time behind bars. The judge didn't even offer an alternative like paying a fine and he told Enzo among other things, quote, foreigners like you should not flout the law, end quote. Well, I guess that was five days of rest for Madeline. And she needed it, because according to her handful of friends, Enzo spent the second half of 1937 beating her more frequently and taking more of her money. They said that he broke her wrist and broke her ribs. She was always in bed recovering from one of his attacks. He eventually, on one occasion, quote, beat her senseless, unquote, and that is what caused their final separation, initiated by Madeline. In May of 1938, Madeline was staying in Palm Beach and finally decided to go a step further than the separation and file for divorce. She did so on the grounds of extreme cruelty, citing that he, one, had knocked her down, and I didn't know if that was in reference to the incident before they got married in which he broke her arm, but two, broke her wrist, three, hit her with a fist after a dance, 
and 4 was exceedingly unpleasant. Now, I said that I wasn't sure what Madeline meant about her charge that Enzo had once knocked her down. As we know, he knocked her down to the floor and broke her arm before they got married, remember? She was in the hospital recovering from the broken arm when she said, I do to him. Well, I first learned about her accusations against Enzo in a book that I will list in my sources for this video series. Well, that led me to do some digging, and this is what I found. This article that was printed in the Daily News Sunday edition on June 12, 1938, called Enzo Beat Her, says Rich White. Now that Madeline had been quickly granted her divorce, the way that the papers had been harping on her for looking old, they were now harping on her ex-husband for having been a terrible boxer. Here's how the story of the divorce begins. Quote, Accounts of the closely guarded decision, reaching here from West Palm Beach, revealed that Enzo used on the Astor Widow the uppercuts and left hooks that he failed to deliver in the American prize ring. End quote. Madeline's accounts of Enzo's abuse were substantiated in court by her own sister, a maid who had worked for her and Enzo, and her physician. These are the accounts that include the charges that Madeline put forth against Enzo when she filed for her divorce. The first sign of trouble occurred only seven months into the marriage in June of 1934, when Enzo wanted $50,000. Madeline didn't give him the money he wanted, so in response, he left her. Left their home in New York City altogether. He went off gallivanting in several places with several women. At least one of those places was California. He returned home when he was ready. Early the next year, in 1935, more than half a year later. Then, who can forget their magical reconciliation after he ran away from her? or so he thought, only to find that she had made her way onto his escape cruise to Italy. Well, the papers printed the story of how they got back together, but in court, Madeline told what the reporters didn't know. Quote, The reconciliation was short-lived, the divorce papers showed yesterday. For on the boat, Enzo committed sundry acts of extreme cruelty, he on several occasions struck the plaintiff, knocking her down. Mrs. Fiermonte related that she was ill at the time, and her illness was augmented by his acts of violence. End quote. Then, while they were in Italy, you know, when Madeline shelled out an extra $17,000 on top of the $10,000 that she had already paid in order to quote unquote keep, and so, yes, on that same trip, he left her at their hotel in Naples while he went out with other women. That was the same time in Europe that Enzo and Madeline fled their hotel because his first wife came looking for him and raising hell at their hotel because she wanted him back. You might remember that Enzo and Madeline took his new sports car to France, and that made for a cute little romantic story to put in the newspapers. But here's what happened while they were there. Quote, While in Paris, they went to a rustic restaurant 60 miles out from the metropolis. Enzo left her and drove away in their car. Night fell. Mrs. Fiermonte had no idea how to get back to Paris and finally began making inquiries. At this juncture, her complaint narrated, the defendant returned, became enraged because she had spoken to anyone about being stranded, knocked her down, breaking her right wrist. End quote. This whole time that she had been fighting Enzo's first wife to get custody, if you will, of Enzo, Enzo was beating her and cheating on her. Did she just need to have a win against his first wife for the sake of her ego? Anyway, then, in Nice, he deserted her once again, not at a restaurant this time, on the waterfront. When he finally drove up to get her, he was teasing her, making her follow the car. You know the thing where someone comes to open the car door, then the driver scoots the car up just enough so that the person trying to get in can't grab the handle to open the door? That's what he was doing. 
and she testified that it went on until she had walked quite a distance. The following summer, the couple returned to the United States and lived in New York, Hot Springs, and Charleston, and in all three places, the beatings continued, or as the Daily News described them, ring caresses. But this is what led up to what Madeline called a grand assault in Newport, Rhode Island. The Fiamantes were visiting Madeline's sister, Catherine. She was also a socialite who had married a rich man. They all went to a dance together. Then, according to Madeline and her sister, when they returned to their room, Enzo, completely unprovoked, struck Madeline after having had a night out that everyone agreed was just a really nice time. This time, he was said to have knocked her down and bruised her. I find it odd that she called this the grand assault, considering that up until this point, he had already broken her arm and broken her wrist. Because I do see Madeline as someone who had an ego problem, I wonder if this occasion was the grand assault, as she put it, because it happened in front of people she knew people in front of whom she had been pretending that her marriage with Enzo was a happy one. Then, she didn't even go into details about almost the whole year of 1937. She just said that he had become exceedingly unpleasant, striking her often and being otherwise cruel. But there was one date that she called out specifically, which clearly was her breaking point, a date in 1937. Here is what the Daily News printed, quote, on August 4th, 1937, the warring pair sailed for Europe again. In Paris, Enzo beat her inhumanly, demanding money, claiming she had neglected to pay his monthly cash allowance. Her long-suffering endurance of his conduct was finally exhausted, and after a trip to Vienna, she returned to the United States alone." End quote. Enzo didn't even bother showing up to court to deny the allegations on his own behalf. By Madeline's day in court, Enzo's attorney had already made arrangements for Enzo to receive roughly one-third of a severance settlement that she had promised to pay him. So he was living it up in France with some women who were in his car when he crashed it. We'll get to that. But many of the newspapers ran the stories of Madeline's divorce and Enzo's car crash side by side on the same pages, some even joking that it was good that he had the rest of Madeline's settlement money coming his way because he would need to use most of it to pay off the victims that he had injured with his reckless driving. Yes, there was a severance package that no attorney, no judge, or any jury required her to pay Enzo. Even with all of these allegations claimed against him, she still sent him off with a severance package a final settlement of $150,000, which is equivalent to roughly $3.2 million today. Was this one last attempt to buy his love? Maybe, but it really did seem like she just wanted to be done. And now that Enzo had such a big chunk of her money, he seemed to be okay with being done. He'd never had so much of Madeline's money at one time. She would spend money on him, but not give it to him. She'd buy him whatever he wanted. For instance, when she purchased her home on 600 acres in South Carolina, he wanted a few minor upgrades, a tennis court, a dog racing track, a yacht dock, and a skeet field. She willingly granted him all of those luxuries, anything that he could enjoy at home with her. He was given expensive gifts and allowances of thousands of dollars at a time in the past. But with this small fortune, this $150,000 settlement from Madeline, he could finally break away, stop pretending he loved Madeline, and do what and who he wanted. And that's just what he did and didn't waste any time doing it. Enzo got out of New York and went back to Europe. This time, he didn't have to sneak away like a thief in the night and Madeline didn't follow him to surprise him this time either. He was living it up in France with as many women as he wanted to see. Madeline was finally done with him. But guess who wasn't? Tosca, wife number one. 
as is told in a Brooklyn Daily Eagle story from 1938, appropriately titled Waiting Wife. At this point, Enzo was being called a motor car speedster boxer. Well, we know that he liked to speed and box the people who reported on it, so I guess that's fair. Now, this was all literally happening at the same time that Madeline was being granted her divorce from Enzo. Tosca declared to the press that Enzo was the only man she ever loved or will love, and she said that she'd be happy to take him back after he was done having his fun with other women. Well, it's good that she knew that she would need to wait her turn, because either on the day or the day after the divorce was finalized, Enzo was in the papers because he was driving his sports car in France in a village near Dijon, with not one, not two, but three women. Unfortunately for one of those young beauties, she was injured in a car accident that Enzo caused when he was speeding and crashed his sporty car right into a tree, causing the car to overturn, thus injuring Marion Whitworth, a 26-year-old actress whose brother had died years before in an auto accident. This accident earned him another prison sentence. And knowing all of that, wife number one still wanted him back. Well, that car wreck was on him and had nothing to do with Madeline. She had divorced him and even paid him well after she had suffered years of beatings. So that would be it, right? Wrong. The very next year, in 1939, Enzo would serve her one more blow, but it wouldn't come from his fist this time, though she probably would have preferred a punch instead of what he did. Before spring could even get underway, Enzo had sold the story of his marriage to a publication called True Story Magazine. Every embarrassing detail of how Madeline had been a fool for him, how she paid to keep him because she didn't think that she could get anybody else, how she knew that her looks were fading, how she knew that other women wanted her husband, and how she knew that other women were having her husband and how she felt too insecure to compete with them because she had lost her beauty. All of it was available for the world to read in the February, March, and April issues of True Story in a series called Kept Husband. It was labeled as, quote, one of the most startling and illuminating commentaries on life among the idle rich ever written, end quote. And Madeline couldn't take it. Whatever people had only suspected before, they now knew. It was what they had imagined and worse. The little bit of a reputation she had was now in shambles. She slipped into a deep depression and she wanted to end her life. She grew more and more dependent on prescription drugs throughout 1939. The following year, in January of 1940, she left her home in Charleston to go back to Palm Beach. In what had been a life full of trips, that would be her last one. On March 27th of the same year, she died at the age of 46. Very close to the age of her husband who had died on the Titanic, John Jacob Astor was 47. Her official cause of death was heart failure, but her friends believed that she had intentionally overdosed on pills. Her estate was worth $1.1 million when she died, and that was split equally between the two sons she had with her second husband, William Carl Dick. She figured that John Jacob Astor, the Titanic baby, would have had more than he needed from the trust that his father's Titanic death had left him. As for her final husband, Enzo Fiermonte's words on her death, quote, Madeline carried her doubts with her always, like her pearls. End quote. Okay, whatever that means. He went on to live out his dreams. He wanted to be an actor and he appeared in over 100 movies and TV shows from the 1940s until the 1980s. Now, I don't know any of the films listed in his IMDb profile. Some of them are Italian. But I see that among dozens of roles, he played military men of various ranks, a boxer, a character named Enzo, and even Al Capone. How's that for life? 
Enzo was never really into Madeline, and he wasn't too fond of her firstborn son either, calling the younger John Jacob a poor little rich boy. Though Madeline didn't leave her first son any money, she did leave him two pieces of her jewelry, a pearl necklace that was valued at just over $1,500 and a diamond solitaire ring that was worth over $50,000. I'd like to think that those pieces had sentimental value. She was almost always photographed wearing a two-strand pearl necklace. Perhaps the ring was the one that John Jacob used to propose to her. That would have been touching if those were the two pieces that she was able to leave to her son. He was the baby who Madeline was carrying on the Titanic, who she named after his father. He was also John Jacob Astor, but he was also known as the Titanic baby. And even though he was born into wealth, he had a lot of troubles of his own. If you want to know the story of that little brat, who was once labeled in a headline as the rich boy nobody wants, let me know in the comments section. Madeline Forrest Astor Dick Fiermonte was not the only woman in history to have been a fool for love. She won't be the last. Someone who could have related to her was Betty Lou Williams. She was a 1940s and 50s circus freak show performer who also gave a lot of her money to a man who she thought loved her. I published a video about her that you can see here. I will also leave a link to it in the description box. My sources for this story are Garrett Clipper Archives, 1933 Shadow of the Titanic by Andrew Wilson the Minneapolis Star Archives, 1933, express.co.uk, The Brooklyn Citizen Archives, 1933, Princeton Daily Clarion Archives, 1933, The Cameron Sun Archives, 1933, Brooklyn Daily Eagle Archives, 1933, 1934, 1937, and 1938. Democrat and Chronicle Archives, 1939. Lancaster New Era Archives, 1939. Daily News Archives, 1933, 1934, 1935, 1938, and 1939. The Buffalo News Archives, 1934 and 1935. And the Star Gazette Archives, 1935. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon. Ties to Hot, Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the Hot, Hot Mess History. The link is in the description box.